Hello and welcome to the Inheritance Podcast. I'm Joe Riley. Today's guest is Jay Hughes. Jay and I had a deep and fascinating discussion about the development of the elder in the family, the importance of the midlife crisis, and transcendent values. We also discussed many great pioneers in the family wealth field, like Joni Bronfman, Charlie Collier, and Peter Karoff. We also talked about Matt Wesley's key paper on family culture, which I will link to in the show notes. Jay also mentioned that he's writing a new book with Mary Duke and Stacey Allred and has a lecture course online with David Specht of the Drucker School, part of which I will also link to about the five capitals of wealth. We also turned over the new ideas of Wealth 3.0, and Jay had some great insights about how the industry restrains the field and how ideas evolve. This is the inaugural interview in the Inheritance Podcast of a series in conjunction with the James E. Hughes Jr. Foundation. I'd like to invite you all to join us on this journey of exploration as I talk to Jay and those he has influenced. Next up is Gunther Weil talking about values. Jay Hughes is an author, advisor to families, and a founder of a law partnership in New York that represented private clients throughout the world and is now retired from the active practice of wealth. His wonderful book, Family Wealth, Keeping It in the Family, has become a classic in the family wealth space where he talks about the shirt sleeves proverb and how it is a warning and not a curse. Please enjoy my interview with Jay Hughes. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Anything said by the guests or hosts should not be construed as legal or investment advice. Thanks for listening. I thought we would start with the simple questions. Okay. Talleyrand or Metternich? Ah, ah, oh, that's a wonderful question. I would say Talleyrand in the sense that he survived five different times in his life and found a way to be useful in all five and survived. Metternich only really had one from 1815 to 1848. But Talleyrand, if we think of that remarkable man, even in the United States where he had to go to avoid the terror in France, and he'd been here in the short time he was in America, he was successful. Also, by the way, if you read his biography, and this has nothing to do with Jay Hughes, but I think it's fun. He was actually from a family that was as close to the royal family as you could be without being a cadet branch. So he had not only did he become a bishop, even though he loved the ladies, and so I suppose Talleyrand. <laughs> Is there anything a family advisor can learn from a courtier? Are there important differences? The great development of a person who is highest utility to a family is to become their privy counselor. The privy counselor, or before that, the chamberlain, was the person who slept outside the king's bedroom or at the bed, at the foot of the king's bed, not in the bed with the queen, no, never, but was essentially physically as well as morally and intellectually the very last person before the king. To become the privy counselor or head regent, it's another way to define it, is to fulfill the great professional mission of someone serving great families, and that is to be a great number two and make someone else greater than he or she would have been, not by manipulation, but by true assistance and true caring. Courtiers have a bad reputation, correctly, because they were by and large seeking something from someone. The privy counselor is seeking to give something to someone. So being a great number two, as I define it, for modern times, I think it's the highest calling of a person in our profession. Is there things that you would avoid? The first thing you must avoid in this world, in this work, is to want to be your client. If you want to be your client, then go and be your client. But don't get into this work. If you want to be in this work, it's because service is your interest in this lifetime. It is how you emerge. Without getting off track, the Enneagram system of nine personality types 
defines something called a nine. I'm a nine. The nine is defined as the peacemaker. Another way to define this role is someone who becomes the chief for peace, which is the highest uh, role in the Iroquois tribe, as a, an example, not the chief for war. So you have to not be your client. And you have to not care that you're not your client. You have to care that you have a different role in this world in this particular lifetime. And that is to help that person be greater than he or she would be. And greater in the sense of a higher level of humanity that they then can serve in the role they're in. History has a lot of great regents. I learn a lot by regency, uh, which is a form of trustee in a way. When the king's too old or the queen's too young or the prince is away, uh, who runs the place? They're not Al Haig, if you remember when he ran in and Ronnie Reagan when shot said, I'm the king, and George Schultz and uh, Jim Baker came in and said, no, General, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, really? No, thanks, General. We'll take care of holding the space when the president comes back. It'll be fine. That's great regency. And that's what being a great number two is. You're there when the need arises, but you don't become the principal. And is there a particular mindset that helps you rise above the politics of the family? When I was in the process, I'll answer it this way. When I was in the process of leaving the practice of law back in the year 2000. Why did I do that? I like being a lawyer. I'm the sixth generation lawyer in my family. I have my son-in-law as the seventh and my new granddaughter is the eighth. So we're extending that lineage. Why did I leave the law, Joe? Many people know that I did because the law left me. I, I discovered, and I should have known that, but I didn't, that the profession of law requires you to have a single client not a family. You can get waivers, but I had some families with already 200 members. And what did they want from me? They wanted me to help all of them as a unit move through the next two generations. That's what they wanted. They didn't want a director. They didn't want a chief of orchestra. No, they wanted someone to work with them in that kind of region process I was talking about, a caring process that they would achieve two more successful transition. The law made that impossible because I, I couldn't get waivers from 200 people. That was ridiculous. So I left the law to go and work with, at that point, 12 families for 10 years to see if we could make those transitions. And my work was to help them help their system culturally grow to be able to ad adopt new ways of doing things, if that was necessary, and adapt to the new issues that the rising generations were facing. That's what great regions do. I wasn't a great one, but that was what I was doing. How did things pan out for those 12 families? 11 of them. One, the gentleman and I found we didn't agree after a year, so we ended. The other 11 I stayed with for 10 years, and they're all doing fine. And what was really a surprise to me was in the eighth and a half year, I realized it was time for me to help them find someone else because I had made an absolute promise that I would be done and kept that promise. And I had people lined up in each of the, to take these places. And when the time came for them to step up, they said no. They all had something else that had come up in the meantime. So I had to scramble. And luckily, there are people in our field who are interested in these kinds of positions, the serving professional position, which is what profession is all about. Medicine, ministry, high academia, law are all about serving. One serves patients, one serves congregants, one serves students, one serves clients, but they're all about service. So I found the people, but I had to scramble to find those new people for the next 10 years of those families. Was there any transition in those 12 families that was particularly tricky? The most complicated transition in tribes, and two of these families were representative of that, the most important transition in the life of a tribe, so social anthropology is the, actually the critical subject to study if you want to understand human groups over a long period of time. And nobody in our field studies social anthropology. <laughs> And yet it's the one academic subject that actually bears directly on our field. In great tribes, 
that are, let's say, a thousand years old, and we have quite a number on the planet who are a thousand years old, and some much longer than that. They have a process in which they look in the, among the young children for the people who might be the caretakers of the mental and physical well-being, might be the caretakers of the lineage and the history, might be the caretakers of the spiritual development of that community, and might be the people that are interested in developing a long-term system of governance that enables a secure next generation to rise in. Four noble professions have always been the formal functions of a great tribe. The task of the elders, not to make this too long, but the task of the elders is to discover those people and get them into the flow, not the normal flow of the work of that tribe, but into the, the flow of those four functions within the tribe. Because you can't actually have a successful tribe without the four functions. Medicine, law, ministry, and high academia, which is how do we know we're human? That's what I mean by high academia, the bard, the storyteller. So what is the progression of those people? Progression of those people is that they move through the normal stages of life in that tribe, often moving into one of those functions within the tribe, along with the other things that one does at different stages of life. And then some of them, not all of them, become elders. To be an elder is an anointed position. It's not something you have because you're old. The old are honored, that's not the point. But the elder is the person who is really interested in the next hundred year cycle of that tribe and its well-being. Wealth is well-being as we're all now speaking about it. The two transitions that I think were most interesting were their discovery of their new elders and then the process of anointing them, actually recognizing that they weren't being given power, they were giving authority. Oh, what a difference. Great families learn how to share authority. They spend no time on power. Families that are failing spend all their time on power. Isn't that interesting? Octoritas is an entirely different word than power. Do you think the elders in that family, was it an individuation process for them? Did Absolutely. they have to yes. cross a certain boundary and, in their own life before they were recognized as? Yes, there would have been some, almost always some midlife crisis. <laughs> in which they discover who they truly are, not yet the, not different than the function they're performing, but how to perform that function. Is it about me as an expert, or is it about me possibly imagining sometime I might be a master? What a difference that journey is. The journey of the expert is sadly way too often, much too short. The journey of a rising elder through beginner's mind and then journeyman attempting to use the mind, the beginner's mind, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, toward the master potter who always makes sure that there's a flaw in the pot for the human reality. It's a whole different journey. The expert's on the clock, that's always our struggle. And the expert is certain he knows, or she knows. The master is certain he does not know. And the she master absolutely says, I don't know. So you think there's a certain letting go and hoping that the answers will come or knowing the answers will come versus trying to know everything? To use a very modern term, the elder, uh, the, the noble professional in profession has no product, none. The expert only has product. The elder, the person in service, says to the family, I can help you with process. You already have a process. And I can help you, if you'd like to, evolve that process, not change it, evolve it. That's a whole different process too, isn't it? Change is radical. Evolution is human. How do I find within the process the next orderly place for this process to evolve to? I think we all know that if you say to a human being, there's no product, it's a process, they're probably going to leave the room as fast as they can go. Of course they will. And yet, for those who are really truly interested in whether there is a third or fourth flourishing generation, they're already thinking out 50, 60 years. They understand it can only be processed and that no product can be of any use. Now, 
there can be an assessment, you could call that a product, that can be useful in the process of understanding how to evolve, but that's not a product. That's a process within the process. If I said as an example, great families all spend some of their early time when they begin to look long-term on how everyone in the family learns. Of course they do, because if you're gonna be on a journey with somebody together for 50 or 60 years, you'd probably like to know that when you're making joint decisions together, and you're gonna make hundreds of them, that person has received the information in the best way he or she can process it. Of course you would. Is it a learning style a product? No, it's a part of the process. It enables the process. That's the only way a family can succeed. The product can't fix anything. Processes are what works. I've never seen anyone ask you about your role in Jamie Johnson's movie. But what did you think of your portrayal and the general message of those films? First, that I should have lost weight before I was filmed. Uh, I didn't know I was going to be in the film. I was very heavy in those days, so I thought, oh my goodness, here I am in the public eye on a movie that's been around for a while, I don't look very healthy. I, I was quite honored and quite surprised to turn up in the movie. I was interviewed for the movie and I was videoed or whatever it was, but I didn't have any idea that I was gonna show up in the movie, particularly where I was gonna show up at the beginning. It was a great honoring of me by Jamie. And I thought, gee, if by being in the movie, in some way, I could express my affection and respect for his doing it, hard, hard thing to do, then I was glad I was there. And what did you think of the films? What did you think of the issues he was struggling with? What we know, the academic, take on an academic stance for a moment. What we know is that asking families with significant financial capital, by the way, not wealth, wealth is well-being. Financial capital is something you might have that might help you grow your well-being, but it's not wealth. That's, by the way, the next 30 years of our field, clearing up that misunderstanding. When the field uses the word wealth as an Anglo-Saxon meaning as well-being, and it uses financial capital to describe species, we will have helped families immeasurably. And Joe, your work in this field has contributed to that thinking. So don't just see there today as my interlocutor. You have been a voice for this reality. And that's what's emerging. And that emergence is of incredible importance to families. If they can think of wealth as well-being, their spiritual, social, intellectual, and human selves and growing those with financial capital supporting, wow, they can go a long way. To Jamie's movie and to these families, by and large in the academic world, it's almost impossible to have families agree to be interviewed and, or if they are interviewed, to have their name associated. And that makes perfect sense. They are prey after all, P-R-E-Y, they are prey. And often those interviews are designed to make them prey. I think what Jamie was able to do was to actually open up the actual reality of the shared human experiences of the people he was filming. And some of those were really hard to watch. Some of those stories were painful. Some were quite reasonable and genuine. But we don't have very much in the field where the kimono has been opened by people who are actually living out the experience of having financial capital. And as I define it, which they received as a meteor from outer space. They didn't grow this. They don't have anything to do with it. If you think about it spiritually, their spirit is completely independent of it. But suddenly, someone else's creativity comes crashing into their individual selves, and they have to integrate it. And I thought Jamie did a very good job of expressing that process of integration or failed integration. Princeton in 1960 was the calm before the storm. Before the decade was out, it would be a very different place. The institutions that used to convey parental and ancestral authority faded. What was it like when you got there? The class of 1960 at Princeton, 1964 actually, arriving in the fall of 1960, we actually arrived in a hurricane, literally. And some of the big trees on Makash Way were blown down that had been living there for 100 plus years. So we got into our rooms with our parents as freshmen and did the best we could in this hurricane. Parents left and the hurricane moved on the Jersey Shore and out the Atlantic Ocean. And 
At four o'clock in the afternoon, we had been advised as freshmen that we were all to gather in something called Alexander Hall, which still exists, a big, huge pile of bricks built in the 1880s or 1890s, a horrible looking building, a real Victorian mess. At four o'clock to be harangued. Harangue is a kind of speech by the president of the college. President of Princeton to then was Bob Coheen. He was the last minister. Before that, all had been Presbyterian ministers. So at four, about 10 of four, holding maps of the campus, because none of us knew where we were going. This 700 of us began to move like little lemmings out of all these different buildings, wearing, of course, coat and tie. You bet. Everybody had blazer, everybody had tie, everybody had gray slacks, and these lemmings, in uniform, essentially, wasp uniform, moved up to Alexander Hall. Now, by the way, we were the first class at Princeton in the history of the college had more high school boys than, than boarding school or private school boys. That we, we were the first. So we arrived in Alexander Hall, Joe, and we sat around and we looked at each other. Nobody, nobody knew anybody, of course. And suddenly, about four o'clock, this parade of people wearing the craziest costumes of academic regalia starts walking up to the dais. And we're all huge eyes, goggle eyes. And here comes the president of the college wearing a huge gold chain, an orange jacket, a funny hat. It was really bizarre. Of course, this was the academic profession. So Goheen gets up there and stands up and we're all wondering, what's he going to say? And Goheen, I've never forgotten this, said the first words out of his mouth were gentlemen. And I don't end to think any of us of the 700 of us that, that had ever been called other than boys. So I was so gentlemen, what is this? And then he said, welcome to the nation's service. And then he spoke for 40 minutes. I've never forgotten it. So Princeton in the fall of 1960 was a group of people expected to be gentlemen, not courtiers, but gentlemen, a certain code of living, a certain responsibility. My dad would say, how do you define a gentleman? You define a gentleman in two ways. One, someone who takes absolute responsibility for hers or her actions, so gentle ladies as well. And in the case of men, he said, someone who knows when it's time to go and leaves. These were his two Victorian views of what the responsibility of gentlemen were. But also this welcome to the nation service. My class of the 650 of us who graduated, 70% became ministers, lawyers, doctors or high academics, 70%. And of the 30%, I would say probably half went home to family businesses and then some went in the military. But this call to the nation's service was a call to profession. And the expectation of the profession was not your individual success monetarily, it was service. This is a very different world that we live in. Not one that's better or worse, but I would say for some of our listeners, they would might well imagine what was life like, not just for a young, wet, behind the ears guy with a blue blazer on, but what did it mean to be asked by a real adult, an elder? Goheen was a great president, was an elder. What did it mean to be a gentleman? And what did, did it mean to be welcome to the nation's service? So you did your senior thesis on the conservatives before the French Revolution. There's an idea from the Romans through de Tocqueville, Digby Balzell, that the nobility or the upper class at least has a social responsibility, that it sets a certain tone for a society, and also has a responsibility to preserve all that's best in a society and pass it along properly to the next generation. Do you think this is still true outside of the family? Well, I'm 80, I'll be 81 in October, and when I was growing up, my mother was a good Presbyterian, was very fond of saying, to whom much is given, from whom much is expected. My psychiatrist not thought that was very good for me. <laughs> but I still believe it. My psychiatrist has been trying to get me off of duty and responsibility whenever I see her. And Why we, is that? And we debate. She doesn't think it's good for me. She thinks I, Jay needs to be more playful and, me, and more less concerned about others and more concerned about himself. And I suppose she's right. That's why I love her very much, and I take her advice. But still, my mother sits on my shoulder. I have been characterized by some friends as an elitist. 
And I do not disagree with this characterization, but not the way that people think about it. So they mean it gently. They don't mean it in some silly way. I think it's terribly important that those in this lifetime who have gifts can be helped by the world that we live in so that they can make those gifts. I don't care much for typing. That's not what I'm talking about. But I do think that assessments of and deep understanding of wisdom traditions of who we are, know ourselves, nothing too much, the basic Greek requirements. I do think some of us have gifts. So here we sit this morning with giving each other a gift and a gift that res reflects and respects each of our journeys to this point in our lives. And the gift that we're giving of that respect for each other is something that might help someone else imagine what are his or her gift. I think this old biblical proposition, Joe, to whom much is given from whom much is expected, is not a should. It's a reflection of what human beings, Bibles and ancient texts like this, are reflections of social anthropological history. How would, what did people see about each other? What could they express to each other about may, what made a habitable society? I think it's really important that those who are given gifts responsibly then give those gifts. Do you have any thoughts on the transition from the old establishment to the current version of meritocracy? The, gosh, there's so many ways to answer this. I'm gonna to try to think of something reasonably short. Because this is epigenetics, The Sun Also Rises, which is a fascinating book about fifth and sixth generation families still doing useful things. There, there's a lot of anthropology about genetics or epigenetics that isn't eugenics. It's actually pretty serious, not pretty, very serious science that almost nobody in our modern world knows what's going on around us. What I think is really important is that our social system recognizes gifts and then where the old system was better, I think, than the new system those with those gifts were socialized into that system to eventually be its elders. Remember, elder is not older. Elder is not a position of authority, a president. It's not somebody, no. It's a position you get because you become discerning. So if I was going to answer this question in a certain way at this stage of life, I would say the people I most want to be with are those who are discerning. And I think it probably takes 30 or 40 lifetimes to get to the place of, that you might be able, maybe occasionally be discerning. I think the old system actually did that. Now, people said, no, it was based on wealth as money. It was based on Talleyrand. Your 19th great-grandfather in the ninth century knew the French king. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a society that works in such a way that the elders are finding those of most ability in that particular time and socializing them toward they're about eventually being of service to that system. That's meritocracy, but not the way it's being practiced. Why not? Because meritocracy now is how much can you get? It's very hard to find anything about how much you will give in it, not philanthropy. You're talking about get as in money. Yeah, the books that are being written, brilliant social science on whether meritocracy actually works Oh, boy. So meritocracy in the 1970s as it was being, or 60s as it was being imagined, but meritocracy in, in 2023 as it's actually being practiced looks an awful lot like the old system. The young man in India gets on a boat. Why? Because he has ambition and capacity. Where does he go? Across the... Indian Ocean, then up through <laughs> in the Atlantic Ocean, and then he takes a train or a plane to San Francisco. And he is creative, and he creates financial capital through his brains, okay? He marries, maybe he doesn't, he has children, but he spends no time with them. He's too busy, just like all the other robber barons, and by the way, the kings and queens and everybody else all the way back in history, and then the second generation of him and his wife, or she and he, because it could be a lady who gets on the boat in India, 
has a family, but the family isn't yet a family. It only becomes a family if their children decide to be a family. And you can't have a society, by the way, this is not off track. Aristotle said you cannot have a flourishing society unless the families that are its building block, because it's a social system, are flourishing themselves. We are in danger. Because the meritocracy doesn't breed better families or more successful families in the context we're talking about, being building blocks with flourishing society. It doesn't. The families in the second and third generation have exactly the same issues as the Bible. Uh, yes, I was preaching the first time in my life about two weeks ago in Aspen. I had two Sundays at an Episcop two services in an Episcopal church. And I was talking about wealth as well-being. I had nine minutes. Can you imagine Jay is here? Nine minutes? Oh, my God. I sweat for a week to get to nine minutes for twice, two nine minutes. The reading in the Episcopal Church that Sunday, because the Book of Common Prayer was being read all over the world, the Old Testament was the story of Jacob and Esau, dysfunctional family. Meritocracies don't, produce better families any more than the old system produced better families. Better families are produced by the second generation deciding to be a family and having that as its highest purpose. I don't really see very much difference, to be candid. What I see is a sorting, S-O-R-T, not assorting, but I see a sorting by, rather than, let's say, birth lineage, asserting by financial capital success. But I don't see different issues in the families when the family begins the journey of becoming a family. I see exactly the same issues. Do you think the upper class has become more isolated? Intentionally, yes. Oh, yes, intentionally. Oh, goodness, the book that the woman wrote here about New York City, about the female members of the new aristocracy, it's all about barriers. Uneasy street. Yeah. Yes. But it's brilliant, brilliant social science. And all of them are living in tiny enclaves until they can get to another enclave and another enclave. But their connection to any social action, I don't mean philanthropy, just social action. I'll give you an example from my city of Aspen that's painful. Jackie and I had four dinner parties. It's the election of 2016. Trump and Hillary are going to go right. at it. I was fascinated by a question, and this comes to the isolation question. So at the dinner parties, and Aspen is a very liberal city, so we have basically liberal people there, all real le left liberals. I asked at a dinner party, very open, no agenda, do any of one working class person. We had 24 people total at those, not one person at the dinner party knew one working class person. One lady, bless her heart, said, oh, well, the house manager knows them. These are all people in the new aristocracy. Joe, I'm not being unkind. I'm not throwing flaming things at people. I have seen no change in my lifetime. So how do you think the flourishing family integrates with a flourishing society or influences it. Let me say again, if we take Aristotle for a moment and we think of the endless books and pundits and movies and things written about why we don't have a flourishing society, hundreds of books, are, are we at the end of the extinction of our, the world? We have all kinds of Jeremiah's lamenting all over the place. So we take Aristotle for a moment as, a, I think, a discerning person in history who says you can't have a flourishing society, which everyone says he or she wants, if the families that make it up are not, at the building blocks, are not flourishing themselves. So I then say, all right, if, you, if your goal is to have a flourishing society, by the way, that's one in which all voices can be heard. Not all with the same degree necessarily once we discern the messages, but everyone must be heard and no one must be canceled. That's for sure. But in open flourishing society of that sort, that is what people want, then I asked them, Aristotle made this statement, not Jay Hughes. Aristotle said, 
okay, if that's what you want, then your family has to be a fundamental building block of it. Is your family flourishing? I don't get a lot of really excited answers because to grow and really enable a flourishing family, it has to be your priority. You have to choose. One of the things that's really hard for me as an old man is how few people make any choices anymore. What do you mean? Well, they make sure that they don't have to make choices. They buy services to avoid choices. Specifically. Well, as an example, how many, a lot of, let's take the meritocrats in the cities. Are the men going to the hardware store? Why did you go to the hardware store? Because you had to fix something. We can't, you're responsible for something. I'm just using one image. And by the way, in the hardware store, you got to meet lots of working class people who actually knew more about the problem you were trying to fix at home than you did. So you didn't right away call the plumber. Yeah if you got a pipe that's breaking. But the point is, you, you took responsibility for the core things, and you had services that you went into and learned from, not just got a product. And then you went home and you tried it out. And that's a fundamental part of building a society. That's honoring each other's gifts. To build a flourishing family, you have to believe that's your priority. I'm saying it a second time. And I mean it. When Matt Wesley, so maybe I'll finish this question this way, about flourishing family. When Matt wrote his incredible paper, Culture Age Structure for Breakfast, mm -hmm. which I think is one of the greatest things ever written in our field, not just in modernity, this is all through all the history of books that we have. He was asking a profound question. He was saying, if you're relying on structures to grow your flourishing family, you are planting your family on rocks because those structures have no culture. If you want to grow your family and grow it on land where the seed has a chance of growing, that great biblical requirement of the Christ, then you have to have a culture that is that soil, that fertile soil. Growing culture is hard work. It's process work. It requires hundreds of decisions over a long period of time to discover whether the fourth generation of your family is flourishing or not. Dennis's great book, Borrow From Your Grandchildren, when Dennis asked me to write the foreword to that book, it was my opportunity to say to Dennis, did you discover, I think you did, that the only families in your book were families of affinity, not blood? He said, my goodness, Jay, you're right. By the time they could get into my book, which was third generation and later, whatever blood idea they had was gone. They knew it was a fallacy from day one. Of course, Genesis got up two different people of no blood. Leave that aside. They became families of affinity people working together with positive connection toward a culture of human thriving, of human flourishing. It's hard work, but that's what Aristotle was imagining, wasn't he? Aristotle was imagining that in the society that he was imagining of a flourishing human community, the families making it up were working very hard on family as a common endeavor of affinity. And could they then become a family as he imagined it in a flourishing society. I will say one other thing, and this is a curmudgeonly thing to say, but it astonishes me in the modern meritocracy how much time is spent on philanthropy, which is no more than giving to strangers, when the same amount of time is not given inside to the members of that family. That's a real mismatch. Not opposed. Philanthropy is necessary. A social system that enables those with less to have a better chance, that we're all in favor, Every, everyone's in favor of that. But my, my question, it's a hard question to the new meritocracy is, where are you putting your time? Because where you put your time tells me what your priorities are. And I have no opinion of what your priorities should be. Only twice in this entire wonderful chat with you have I used the subjunctive, should, could, or would. I threw it out of my vocabulary 50 years ago because I thought it was the minor key. I thought it, I like shall, can, and will. Let's go for a, a major key sentence. So I don't have any shoulds or oughts or stuff. I, that's other somebody else's business. But I do think people can look at the question and say, what are my priorities? And then look at how they spend their time as an indication of what they actually are. What did you learn from Gunther Weil? Gunther and I met 
even though we were living 40 miles away from each other in Japan at a very strange week of six of us from the West and six Japanese talking about the most substantive questions of Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy. And then after we had two days on philosophy, we had two working days on three, I can't remember, health, education, and a third subject, maybe the judiciary. What was, how did those philosophies of the West and the East get actually played out in the major social subjects? So here I am sitting with Gunther Weil. We don't know each other. My wife knew his first wife. Maybe she knew Gunther. I didn't know them. And in Japan. And we worked really hard for those days. And Peter White was there. I can't remember who else was there. And some remarkable Japanese philosophers. And we became friends. He was not doing this work when I first met him. But he got interested in it through me same way that Charlie Collier did. Because we were, I was talking at that time with, with Gunther or Charlie or others about how to look at this question of wealth as well-being rather than looking at wealth as a question of financial intermediation. And Gunther got very interested in that because of his work with Gurdjieff. And Charlie got very interested in it because he needed a different model that wasn't satisfying to him for raising money. He wanted Charlie, and then I'll come back to Gunther, but I'm weaving them because I met them both more or less at the same time, very different circumstances. Charlie was trying to find a way for Harvard to give back to its most appreciated donors. And Gunther was trying to find a way to use what I would call Buddhist and particularly Vita uh, philosophical ideas and what he'd learned at Harvard with the Timothy Leary movement and find a way in his own life to apply those ideas to human communities. And to some extent, as we got to know each other, this idea of wealth as well-being, this idea that there were qualitative capitals that you could grow, that a family could have a process, find, uh, particularly in spiritual capital, the highest of the capitals, the culture it could develop, was fascinating to Charlie and also fascinating to Gunther. I think, again, if, as, one, as soon as one can move from expert, we were talking about this a lot, quite a long time ago in this interview, and the product orientation of a skill to being curious about the questions of what the great human philosophers and authors have said about the question of a culture of a successful family, you're just on a different journey. Tell us a little about Peter Karoff and what you learned from him. Peter and I met at the introduction of Peter White long years ago. I miss Peter every day. Peter and I were very interested in the question, again, of how do you grow a flourishing society? Peter was in it, both influenced by his own personal experiences and then by the Rockefellers, who essentially, as with so many great things in America, brought PPI to life, brought the philanthropic initiative to life. Peter thought that you could train, and that's a complicated word, donors to be strategic, because he saw that a lot of philanthropy was basically charity. A caritas, the uh, root word under the word charity, the word care, he saw and helped me see as basically the work of a civil, of an appropriate society. That society has a duty to care for all of its members at some level. And he said to me from the beginning, this is not philos anthropos. Philos anthropos, the Greek words that underlie the word philanthropy, are love of your fellow man. This is different, he would say to me. Caring is one thing, very important. Love of your fellow man is something else. So I think he was in the world to make us all conscious that charity and philanthropy are different, both necessary. But that if we were going to do philanthropy, which is the freest money in the world, money set aside for philanthropy is the freest money in the world. What do you mean it's by that? It belongs to the world. Remember, it, it, despite the way people think, a philanthropist who has taken advantage of the structures of philanthropy to set aside permanently a certain amount of money has given that money to the world. It's not his anymore or hers anymore. and never will be. They've become a regent or not. They've become a trustee or not. They've adopted the fiduciary fides, the duty of, to others or not. I think, it's, I think we could dare say that there is a lot of structured philanthropy 
where the gift has never been made to the world. Structurally it has, but emotionally and spiritually it hasn't. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when it's real philanthropy, which is what Peter was advocating, then he would say, "This Jay, this is the free, and we'd agree, this is the freest money in the world because it's no longer subject to anybody except some attorney general in some very narrow way. You can do anything you want as long as it's for a consistent giving, as long as it's expressing love of your fellow man or woman. So Peter was in the world, I think, to teach us that. And he did teach us that. He certainly taught me that. And then I served on his board for years and we were great friends. I miss him every day. Great spirit in the world. What did you learn from Joni Bronfman? I learned from Joni Bronfman what it is to live with a huge negative surprise. Joni became my client as a very young woman. And she became my client because her father had said something to her that is the issue basically of her that she's lived with the rest of her life. She's the eldest of four children, very gifted intellectually, went to college, got great grades, and prepared herself to be an executive of the Seagram's company. Came home from college with an excellent degree and said to her father, she was ready to, to go to work. And her father said, Joni, girls don't work in the business. She'd never gotten over it. So she said, what are girls supposed to do? Get married and have children. This had nothing to do with Joni. But she said, then how am I useful? Because the path that you essentially set for me has nothing to do with who I am. So her meteor, as I wrote about in the cycle of the gift, her meteor was to come home from college and be told there was no job. And then for the rest of her life, she had to live with that reality. And I am so proud of her. The life that she's created for herself, so incredible work she's done writing her thesis, but also with many other women who had similar stories, not the same story, but some story of some inherited wealth, financial capital, not wealth, coming into their lives unexpectedly with expectations associated with it and nothing to do with who that person was. And then how does that woman live? Boy, is that an existential question. And Joni has been a great voice for that existential question. To get your thoughts on Wealth 3.0. When the idea of Wealth 3.0 was first exposed to me quite some, no, a number of years ago, I could not understand the enthusiasm that, with which it was being expressed. Now that the book is finally out, after I think the authors had a lot of revisions from the draft that they were circulating to the book that we're now reading, because the field spoke back to them, not backhandedly, but spoke back to them very honestly and frankly, I think. If I were to look at the book, what I would say is that, first of all, I don't believe in change. I don't. I believe in evolution. So if you say that there's stage one, stage two, stage three, I can see how things evolve. I don't think things change. So I can see how, let's say, newer academic specialties that emerge out of the academy, once truly tested, can be useful. So when E.O. Wilson developed social anthropology in the 1970s, he was almost thrown out of the academy for eugenics. And yet today, evolutionary psychology, social psychology, and social anthropology are basically the three academic areas that most bear in our field. They're the only ones that are about how families become clans and tribes and kins, and the only things that actually speak to the issues of, our, of a flourishing family, other than philosophy and, and spiritual documents. 3.0 says in the final sections something very important, which the authors agree they have nothing to say about which is, I think, absolutely right. They say that the lawyers are the problem. And they say, we have techniques in positive psychology that could be useful to a family. By the way, I, I think arguing about statistics and true or false are ridiculous. All statistics can be made to say what you want them to be saying. If, if we went back for a minute to the Shirtsley proverb, I never have said in any time in my career that it will, will come true, ever. 
What I've said is it's the universal cultural description of families as they were experienced in every culture on the planet. So I said, I think one should pay attention to that. Not that it will happen to you, but then I've asked a separate question. I'll come back to 3.0, but I'll come back to it this way in the lawyers. What I've asked people is, do you understand that in physics, you come from energy to matter to energy, just basic physics. A family is the same. Two people, no blood, come together and create something called family genesis. They take energy and make it matter, matter this family. Someday that family, that matter goes back to energy. That's the nature of our universe. Can't change those rules. So the great question, one of the great questions of my lifetime and every family that I've helped is, do you care about when it happens? Will happen, but do you care profoundly about when? And the families that, can, that care profoundly about when it will happen do very well because they understand the problem. What the authors of 3.0 have said is, we have new techniques we think can better help a family that decides when is its priority. In that sense, I think the book is useful. I was very sad that the book did not define wealth as well-being, but really uses the word wealth throughout the third key chapters of the book, the third part of the book, as financial capital, but it doesn't say financial capital. I think the reader would get a lot more from the good ideas in the book if the book had said very carefully when it was talking about financial capital and when it was talking about wealth. And by the way, I expressed that thought to the authors. That's not me speaking out of school. They chose not to do that. That's fine. It's their book. But I do think that their comment that the problem is the lawyers is not the Shakespearean comment about let's kill the lawyers. No, the problem is that the state of my profession, my noble profession, ministry, high academia, medicine, and law. The problem in our field of law today is that the vast number of planners in the law firms, which is where the documents have to come from, that's monopoly on those documents, still lies with lawyers. The lawyers basically are responding, particularly in the meritocracy, by the way, this is to the questions you asked me a while ago, about saving taxes and avoiding creditors. Fine. The problem is that human beings can't live in those documents. There's no culture. The document has no culture, just as Matt said. That is the lawyer's problem. Until the lawyers make put culture, a way of living, a way of imagining, into the structures have no purpose except creditors and taxes. The problem, Joe, and I wind up this way, Mary Duke and Stacey Allred and I are writing a book now the core question of which is going to be, can the family live in the plan? By the way, over 200 interviews so far, not one lawyer has said yes. Of course not, because they're not considered. No one spends any time in the planning process on the ability of the human beings to live in the plan. They have no roles. They have no voices. They have no author for the play that they're going to live in. Of course they don't. Now, some of us in the old system, by the way, in the old days, were trained that you wouldn't make a structure until you were certain the people that were going to live in that structure could live in it, but that's disappearing. So when 3.0 says, and throws its hands up, by the way, and correctly, this is not a criticism at all. This is, I think they're absolutely right. They said, we don't know what to do with the lawyers. And our book doesn't have any answer for that. I would say that's the core next question of the people who are going to try to bring 3.0 to life, not as a book or an idea, but to bring it to life, is can they work with the lawyers to create culture for the structures in which people will live? So we've already talked about this a little bit, but I think the tension in the book and maybe the reason there was a enthusiasm for it is that the question today is, how do you define the difference between the field, whatever field it is that we, we're in, and the industry? And Yeah, and if I were to sit with my colleagues who wrote 3.0, I would say, if the third chapter of your book had been a clarion call for wealth as well-being and financial capital as something else, then the bell curve whether it's investment management firms, consulting firms, law firms, all the different elements, the bell curves of quantity and quality, which is the core division in our world, 
quantitative and qualitative, become starkly clear. If at the top of the book, a page, it says wealth is well-being, and over here on the left-hand side of the bell curve, you have firms saying we're in the wealth management business who are actually in the financial management business, the clients would understand what they do. I'm not being critical at all, which is clarify, clean up a whole lot of consciousness problems. And then you look at the same bell curve and you look at some firms on the right-hand side of the bell curve who are clearly qualitative only. They can manage your financial capital, but only in such a way that it integrates with the qualitative experience of their clients' lives, their well-being. That isn't stark. That's the actual consciousness problem. Field, industry, whatever you want to define it, has not accepted, but it's reality. These are not quantitative issues of a flourishing family. They're qualitative issues. Of course they are. So if Aristotle is asking, is your family a fundamental building block of a flourishing society? He's not asking a quantitative question. He's asking a qualitative question. Wealth as well-being is a qualitative question. Then if I say, okay, I'm in the financial management business, everybody understands what I'm doing. I don't then need to look to that group of people who are committed intellectually to a dynamic preservation of financial capital for the qualitative questions I need help with. I need to find the qualitative, and I think what the 3.0 people are arguing is that they are those qualitative people. Maybe. What I would say is that that distinction is a huge difference between quantity and quality. And I think wealth as well-being gives us consciously an understanding that the qualitative question is the ones we must spend our time on. Not at the expense of the quantitative's purpose, as I did with my hand gesture for years, is to give the means to grow the qualitative capital. Wealth as well-being is, I think, our future. So you need to find a transcendent value. Yes. And that's what I believe Charlie was trying to do, Charlie Collier, when he changed his practice after he heard my he talk in St. Louis. He came to me and said, I have to start all over again. And Gunther Wilde, these are, not, these are people that were not, uh, I, that were the great people, Peter Karoff, the people we've named today. These are, these are qualitative people. Looking back 30 years on your trip through the dark wood, do you have any nuanced thoughts on that? Do you think that was an important part of your own journey? I have said to many people, Joe, who come to me and say, Mr. Hughes, or Jay, or whatever, we, we, we'd like to do what you do. And I say, that's great. I'm thrilled. Have you had a midlife crisis? <laughs> what? And that's all I say. <laughs> Why do you think it's so important? It is interesting that a lot of the folks in our industry at some point took a turn. They were looking for something more, perhaps. It does matter, I think, to choose a profession, if one is wants to be in a life of service. And then in the early stages of that profession, whichever of the four paths you're on, you have to learn a lot about vocabulary. You have to learn about uh, ethics. There are a lot of things you have to learn as a pupil. Then those things that you're learning as a pupil, the modern system says, do more of those things and become an expert. And that is the future. And then one day you discover, which is the problem of the dark wood, you discover that expertise is in no way able to solve the actual problems your congregants or your students or your patients bring you. They are skills that are useful. But the question is, what is the spirit that is actually, essentially, using those skills? And that's a question of a good midlife crisis. <laughs> Do you feel like you had a good midlife crisis, Jay? I feel like I had a really good midlife crisis. And as many people know, in a building three blocks from where we're sitting, one night I opened the window on the 12th floor and was within five minutes of jumping out. That's a great midlife crisis. I didn't know that. No, I've told that, that story publicly. I have no, I'm not embarrassed by it, but 
I understand what it means to well, be low. Well, I, what brought you to the edge? What was it? A uh, my marriage had broken down, so that. But the professional side was even more poignant because I thought I'm not helping. I don't have any opinion about what anybody else does, particularly. I really don't. People's lives are their spirits and process of 10,000 years is my good Buddhist practice of evolving to join the universal consciousness. But I think crisis is part of life. And I think that you, at least for me, again, not for anybody else, you have a crisis like that, you decide to stay around, you're empty, and what a great place it is to be empty. Yeah, but how did you close that window? I called my mother. And she said she didn't think it was a good idea. I said, okay. And I said, and uh, so I did work my ba way back. But you don't just come back from that. You work your way back. But, and one of the things that I did as a result of that was I thought, okay, if you're going to really help, so you're not back here again. If you're really going to help human beings flourish, then you've got to re-educate yourself and go and read all the things that you didn't read. So I started almost immediately after that crisis what I call my Forrest Gump reading. And I'm still like Forrest Gump reading. Remember Forrest Gump when sure. his beautiful lady dies? And he says, I'll go for a run. And he thinks he'll just run down to where the road meets the main road. But then he thinks he'll come run a little longer. That's my reading. It never ends. Never ends. There's always another remarkable thing to learn. And, and an idea that you've never run into. And you think, wow, that's a great idea. Isn't it marvelous? All the great ideas have long since been thought. The question is access to them. Whether it's building a library in Alexandria in 300 BC, or the Muslims building a great library in Cordoba, or in Baghdad, or all the great, every great culture, by the way, that's emerged into a civilization has built libraries. And everyone, some great person, had an intention to get all the world's knowledge into the library. Not to protect it, but so it could be learned. Forrest Gump reading. It's good advice. <laughs> Jay Hughes, thank you. Always a joy and a pleasure. Pleasure was mine entirely, Joe, and great work you're doing. Thank you. Namaste. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, please share it with your friends and take a minute to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate it.